Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, our pest education seminar on mosquito control. Before we get started, I want to go over a few ground rules. Please, everyone, mute your line. You can use the chat box to answer to ask any questions, and we'll answer them all at the end of the webinar. If you have any additional questions um, that we don't get to answer or you think of after the webinar, please email them to us at education at nola.gov, and we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel. It does say our website, but we'll post it on our YouTube channel, and I'll put the link to that in our chat. Today, we have Dr. Jennifer Bro speaking to us. Dr. Bro was born and raised in the Metro New Orleans area. She received her BS in biology from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and her PhD in mosquito ecology from Illinois State University. She completed two postdoctoral research associate positions in Brazil before returning to New Orleans. She is now a research entomologist at the City of New Orleans Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board, where she supervises all mosquito surveillance programs. She also designs and manages applied projects of various topics, included, including methods validation, biological control, and vector-borne disease risk assessment for city issues like flood water management. Dr. Bro plays strong roles in public outreach and education, as well as professional training for pest control and public health personnel. Among her most important tasks is maintaining relationships with academic and agency partners in order to adapt best practices and research and IPM framework to our local needs and concerns here in New Orleans. And now we'll have Dr. Bro. All right, thank you. <laughs> Looks like uh, I had a little mute issue here. Okay, thank you all for being here today on this lovely Tuesday afternoon, and thank you, Astasia, for the introduction. Um, just a brief outline of what I would like to talk about today. First, the basics of mosquito biology and the mosquito life cycle. I'm gonna talk a little bit about IPM and surveillance programs, go over some of our control methods, uh, talk about the importance of resistance screening and give you a little bit of insight into our program and what we do here. And then I'll talk about a really important component of prevention of vector-borne diseases, which is ed education, outreach, and training programs. So to get started, uh, mosquito classification. Mosquitoes are in the biological order Diptera. Uh, if you break that apart, it's Latin diptera. That means two wings. So this is the biological group that includes the true flies, which are flies, gnats, midges, and mosquitoes. So essentially, mosquitoes are just flies that bite. Mosquito life cycle consists of four different stages. We have our eggs, which are laid on or near aquatic bodies of water. We have our larvae, which undergo four developmental instars or stages with molting in between, and those are fully aquatic as well. We have our pupal stage, which, which is an aquatic stage, and that is our metamorphic stage. And then the pupa molts into your adult mosquito that flies around. What do mosquito larvae feed on? That is the huge developmental stage in the mosquito life cycle. And the larvae feed on bacteria and other microorganisms that are derived from decaying organic input in the water column. So things like dead insects, leaves, um, shells, all sorts of stuff that falls into the water column. So they have a really interesting feeding and reproductive behavior. Female mosquitoes, that adult mosquito, feeds on both animals and humans. Different species may have different preferences for certain blood hosts. So as an example, our Culex mosquitoes typically prefer to feed on birds. Some of them will feed on birds and humans, and that's how some of our disease cycles are introduced into human populations. Mosquitoes are attracted by certain skin compounds, also carbon dioxide from our breath, and then body heat. 
a recent study, they've been trying to figure this out for quite a long time, and there's a recent study that came out in October of last year that actually identified a candidate compound in the skin that is shown to increase attractiveness to mosquitoes, and I have that reference here. And so um, differential mosquito attraction to humans is associated with skin-derived carboxylic acid levels. This is a really fascinating paper, and there's a bunch of news stories about it as well, so definitely uh, look that up. So female mosquitoes, once they become adults, they typically only mate once and they do store sperm for the rest of their lives. All adult mosquitoes, males and females, feed on sugar. That is their energy source. The difference is that females need blood just to produce their eggs. They need the protein from blood for vitelogenesis. So males, for this reason, do not blood feed. They have no need to produce eggs and therefore they don't feed. So anytime you're out at your picnic and you're getting bit by a mosquito, it's definitely a female. So the mosquitoes can produce batches of eggs about once a week for the rest of their lifetime. After that single mating, they just need to get another blood meal every time they produce those eggs. How long does a mosquito live in the wild? People ask me this all the time. We really don't know. Um, estimates are up to about six weeks, but it can be much shorter than that, depending on the temperature. So what are mosquito eggs? Again, they lay them on or near the surface of water bodies. Um, depending on the genus and species, they will lay eggs in different ways. Um, one example is that our container 80s mosquitoes, like Albopictus and Aegypti, will lay their eggs singly, but they will lay many of them. And they tend to do this on the sides of water holding containers just above the water line. That is because their eggs require uh, dry and re-wetting cycles in order to hatch. So they lay above the water line. I don't know if y'all can see my cursor, but here it is. Um, and then when the container uh, fills with water from rain, it will keep those eggs to hatch. And so that's part of their biology. Culex, on the other hand, what you see on the bottom right here, um, they lay what's called egg rafts. This can be many eggs, up to several hundred, and they're all sort of glued together in a little raft. Um, they float on the top of the water body, and they have a timed hatch, so they will typically uh, hatch into larvae in about two to four days. The larvae, once the eggs hatch, are little worm-like looking critters. Um, they come out in huge uh, numbers, depending on the species. Um, this is a picture of a larvae up close. You'll see it all the way on the right. So they typically, you'll find them in huge numbers in certain breeding site types. Um, the larvae come out very small, first in stars. You can barely see with the naked eye. And by the time they become adults, they are about a quarter of an inch long, sometimes larger. Development through their four instars uh, takes anywhere from five or six days all the way up to 14 or 15 days. How quick they develop is also dependent on things like the temperature outside, the temperature of the water, how humid it is, and most importantly, how much food they have. So the more food they have, the faster they can develop and the larger they can become. So interestingly, larvae can develop in extremely small amounts of water. One example that I always like to talk about is uh, the discovery of Aedes aegypti breeding in the caps of 20 ounce bottles. So it doesn't take very much at all for some of our container breeders. Pupae are the next uh, life stage. They are a non-feeding metamorphic stage. So this is akin to the cocoon and the butterfly life cycle. They do not feed. They have little respiratory trumpets that stick out to the air surface. And you can see on the right for the larvae, they also have a little respiratory siphon. Um, so they do both breathe air. The uh, pupae do not move, um, but they will dive if they're threatened. So they do have sort of a defense mechanism and they're able to perceive differences in shadows to avoid predation. Finally, we have our adults. The adults emerge from that pupil case. You can see a nice picture of that on the bottom left. That's from the CDC website. Adult mosquitoes are sexually dimorphic. That just means that males and females look different. Uh, one of the most striking characteristics that are different between males and females, if you look at the top right photo, that is a male Aegypti. You can see that they have uh, what we call plumose antennae. So they're very feathery, fluffy antennae. And then they have very long palps, and the palps are sort of that little trident on the end. The palps are sort of their feelers. So that's how they detect chemicals and detect things. 
Whereas the females have a very long skinny proboscis. They do have palps, but they're extremely short. You can see those right here, these little white things. And then their antennae tend to be long and thread-like. Uh, the other big uh, difference is that the males are much smaller in size for some species. So a little talk about diversity. Uh, this is another question I get a lot. How many mosquitoes do we have here? Uh, there's really astonishing diversity in groups of mosquitoes. We have about 3,500 species worldwide that we are aware of. They occur everywhere on the planet except Antarctica. What's interesting about this is only a few hundred of those 3,500 species have any sort of impact on animal or human health, so less than 10%. The genera that are most responsible for disease are our 80s mosquitoes, our Culex, and then our Anopheles. What does local diversity look like? We have about 176 species uh, that might have been updated in the last year, um, but that's about right. In Louisiana, we have about 85, and in New Orleans currently that we know of, we have about 40 species. So how do we classify mosquitoes and how do we begin to understand their biology, where they live, uh, how they behave, and then how we can ultimately try to manage their populations? A very convenient classification that we commonly use is classification by breeding habitat. So we can generally say they are floodwater breeders, permanent water breeders, or container breeders. And we can break these individuals down even more, but we won't go there today. We'll just talk about this uh, for convenience. So what is a floodwater breeder? These mosquitoes uh, basically reproduce in temporary pools of water um, that are typically transient in nature. So this can be something like a snowmelt pool, um, salt marshes that have flooded inlets, um, tidal flooding, pasture that floods. There's a lot of really, um, terrible agricultural pests that like to breed in flooded pasture, roadside ditches that are typically too low for mosquitoes to breed in, but after a big rain, um, they hold a lot more water. So what's interesting about their biology is that they deposit eggs actually on the ground in moist soil near the water. And so when that water body uh, fills, it inundates those eggs that are in the soil, and then they come out in very, very large numbers after flooding. One of the reasons floodwater breeder numbers can be so large is because the eggs that are deposited in that soil can persist for two or three years in some cases if that area doesn't flood and will still um, be viable. So again, they bite humans, livestock, and pets. There are lots of different species of floodwater breeders, but uh, some common ones around here are in the 80s Culex and Serophora um, genera. So here's a few examples of ones from our local collections. We have Serophora howardii, which is very common here. Aedes vexans, um, the word vexans itself means like to vex, to make you mad. Um, and then we have Aedes solicitans, which is technically a salt marsh breeder, but again, they're not breeding really on the permanent water section. They're breeding in these flooded inlets. Next, we have our permanent water breeders. They're pretty much across the board. We have species in plenty of genera. Um, these are gonna be found in your calm and still bodies of fresh water, uh, typically in areas that have a lot of sunlight that increases nutrient production in the water body. Um, a lot of surface vegetation, they like to hide under it. There are some species that even specialize in living among the roots of these aquatic plants, um, and they actually pierce the roots and breathe through the plant and that that way they don't have to surface. Um, that's your Mansonia and your Cochlatidia species. So edges of ponds, inlets of slow moving uh, streams, sort of inlets of wetlands and marshes that don't dry out, and then water hyacinth and water lettuce are two of the aquatic vegetation types that are um, commonly associated with these permanent water breeders. A couple examples from our local uh, collections, Culex restuans, Cochlatidia perturbans, and Anopheles quadrimaculatus. Finally, we have my favorite and the kind that I have the most experience with, and this is container breeders. So these are mosquitoes that will breed, lay eggs in containers of various shapes and sizes. Again, as small as a bottle cap can be as large as a swimming pool. So anything in between can be thought of as a container. Containers can also be artificial or natural. Um, so tires, buckets, wheelbarrows, children's toys, any sort of 
anthropogenically uh, created container. But then you also have things like bromeliads. A center of a nice big bromeliad plant can hold about four liters of water, uh, maybe more depending on how large it is. And even the leaf axles, the individual leaves on the bromeliad can all hold water. Egypti love to breed in bromeliads. Um, you have tree holes, um, bamboo, uh, lots of other what we call phytotelmata, um, water holding plants. Some common container breeders around these parts and actually globally we have Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, and then locally Culex quincofasciatus, but uh, Pipians tarsalis or anything in those complexes um, in other parts of the country. Um, I do want to mention also, if you look in a lot of the mosquito training books, they will list Culex quincofasciatus as a permanent water breeder. Um, we don't really find that to be the case here. I feel it should be updated. They're really opportunistic breeders. Um, while they typically are not going to lay eggs in extremely small container environments, we find them all of the time in tires and fountains um, and other things like that. So I, I would classify them as container, but also some other habitats as well as they see fit. So a little note about vector-borne diseases. Um, I like to sort of break apart the terminology when we talk about the role that mosquitoes play in public health. Um, and you know, you read the CDC stuff and you see things on the news and there's just a lot of terminology. So I like to break this down just to make it very clear what we're talking about when we talk about mosquito-borne disease. So a vector-borne disease refers to any disease transmitted by a vector. So that is an organism that can transmit bacteria, viruses, or parasites from one animal or plant to another, and I'm including humans in the, in the animal category there. Um, Vector-borne diseases can be spread lots of different ways, right? So we have biological transmission, which means they are physically putting something inside of you. And then you have mechanical transmission, which is typically more of a contamination or a contact route of transmission, um, sometimes oral, sometimes by touching. So when we talk about insects, mosquitoes, flies, tritoming bugs, which are the assassin bugs, fleas, lice, and even ticks, which are arachnids, um, these are biological transmission vectors. So they are physically putting something inside of your body. Whereas there are other organisms that can also be considered as vectors, snails, rodents, birds. Um, and so you're sort of getting this in another way. It's another route of transmission with birds, avian flu, with rodents, many of the different sort of bacteria that they spread and their feces and urine and so, uh, and so on. So vector-borne diseases together as a large group account for a whole lot of the proportion of infectious disease globally. It's about 17%. So uh, the estimates are about 700,000 deaths annually, but I really want to highlight that the deaths don't even come close to the burden of morbidity um, that they cause, how much illness they cause, and how long uh, people are sick and out of work and in pain from these diseases. So. Um, I think that also needs to be considered when we're considering the burden of this globally. So now we move on to arthropod borne disease, right? So what is an arthropod? Um, this is the biological group. It's a higher order group that includes not just insects and arachnids, but also crustaceans and myriapods. So you will hear this term a lot, arbovirus. That just means an arthropod borne virus. So it's a virus that can be carried by numerous different arthropods. So I've got a few examples down here. Mosquitoes are on the left. We have sand flies um, in the middle, and then we have ticks on the right. Not all insects, but they are all arthropods. Um, and so that's what they're talking about when they use the word arthropod, or sorry, um, arbovirus, they are specifically referring to viruses transmitted by arthropods. And then we get a little bit narrower when we start talking about mosquito-borne disease. So this is only talking about mosquitoes, what mosquitoes transmit. Um, they do not only transmit viruses, they can also transmit tons of different types of parasites. Um, the filarial worms that are responsible for lymphatic filariasis, they can transmit a canine heartworm. Um, malaria is a type of parasite, and so it sort of encompasses all of the different things that can be transmitted by mosquitoes. So this graph is kind of a heavy graph. Um, the reading, don't worry about reading every single word here. I just want to kind of go over this because it illustrates really nicely the major seven global vector-borne diseases that we're struggling with right now, and then the major groups of vectors that are responsible for those diseases. So from left to right, we have Zika, 
chikungunya, yellow fever, dengue, malaria, lymphatic filariasis, and then West Nile fever, which is our vector-borne disease of big burden here in the south and the southeast. And then on the bottom, we have all of the uh, vectors conveniently sort of drawn up to the diseases they're capable of transmitting. And we have Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, Hemagogus species, Anopheles species, and then Culex quinquefasciatus. And I just want to point out that here in the Gulf Coast region of the United States, we have all of these except for Hemagogus in the middle. So a lot of potential for vector-borne disease transmission here. Thankfully, not a huge burden of anything other than West Nile. And lately, West Nile has been pretty low too, so we've gotten lucky so far. Uh, since we're talking about West Nile being a significant vector-borne disease in the United States, um, I do want to go through the life cycle. Um, interestingly, the disease cycle is between mosquitoes and wild birds. So that is how the disease is sort of uh, kept going. Um, it's mosquitoes that bite birds, the birds get infected, new mosquitoes come and bite those infected birds, and then the cycle continues. Humans and horses can get West Nile virus, but we are what's considered dead end hosts. That means that while we can get the virus and we can become sick from it and even sometimes die from it, um, we are not capable of replicating that virus inside of our bodies enough to become a host for another mosquito to come and pick up that virus from. So um, while we will not be responsible for more mosquitoes getting the virus from us, we can still get sick. So now I want to switch and start talking about, all right, we know the mosquito biology. We're aware of the viruses that we have and how they're transmitted and what sort of those host and vector relationships are on a local level. Now, how do we begin to take that information and push it into programmatic responses? So to give you a little overview of what is going on here in Louisiana, um, we have 64 parishes in Louisiana and 39 of those parishes do conduct some form of mosquito abatement. There are 17 parishes that have surveillance and control districts, so full mosquito control programs like we do here in Orleans. We have another 12 that have contracted services. So this means they hire um, private pest control companies or other entities to conduct surveillance and control for them. Um, so they have it, it's just not run by the government. Then there are additional 10 parishes that have contracted programs that are not surveillance based. So that means they only perform control activities. They don't have any sort of surveillance. So I want to mention that each of the districts of all the 39 parishes that have some sort of program, they are managed independently. Um, and so we all sort of make decisions within our parish jurisdiction and based on our local needs, local species of concern, um, and what our local resources and capacity are. And so that really varies a lot. Staffing, capacity, equipment, and practices is very uh, uh, parish to parish. And hopefully you'll see why um, when I'm finished explaining sort of how we work. So here in New Orleans, we are the Mosquito, Termite, and Rodent Control Board. So we have multiple divisions. Um, our mission here is to minimize the incidence of disease transmission, economic loss, and medical emergencies that are caused by pests. And the way that we do this is through adopting an integrated pest management framework which includes lots of different tactics and strategies. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what IPM is and why it's important to conduct yourself this way if you wanna be able to effectively control pests um, in just a few minutes. So integrated pest management um, is not a new concept. It's been around for well over 100 years and started with agricultural pest management. So controlling pests that were blighting crops um, you will see a lot of different definitions online of what the major tenants of IPM are, but across all sorts of pest control industries, target pests, ag, um, and mosquito control, you will see the same theme. And so these are sort of the six major uh, facets uh, that I believe are important for integrated pest management. First, you have monitoring. So that encompasses all of your surveillance activities. Identification, which I give its own little bubble, because if you are not able to properly identify your pests and your target species um, and, and notice those minor differences in species um, that are very important for the biology and control of the organism, um, you will not have an effective program. 
Finally, we have set action thresholds. Um, that is essentially just reviewing what your problem is and deciding in a science based approach at what point you need to take action. So it's essentially your action plan. Finally, we have control. Um, control is very important. There are lots of different ways we can conduct control. There are adulticides, there are larvicides, there are different types of equipment, there are different life stages you can target, so you have to be aware of all of those options. Prevention is the first line, and this is where your education, your outreach, your training, uh, teaching folks things like source reduction and making sure you're not breeding pests in the first place. And recently, and extremely importantly, another tenet of IPM is testing for insecticide resistance. If you have a control plan in place, but the methods you are using or the products you are using are not effective at killing your pests, then we're wasting a whole lot of time and money trying to make sure that these pests are under control. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these in a little more detail as we go through uh, our program and what we do. I do want to point out that although the tenants of IPM are going to be really similar across districts throughout the country, we all do have our unique problems, our unique species biologies. And so uh, although I, we do have a wonderful program here, there really isn't um, a cookie cutter approach to this, right? You have to sort of view it and evaluate it on a case by case basis based on what's going on in your location. So for us, what does integrated mosquito management look like? surveillance, source reduction, and teaching about source reduction. We do use biological control. We also use larvicides and adulticides. We have a really great uh, insecticide resistance testing program, and we focus a whole lot on public education. So we're going to go through these sort of one at a time and give you sort of an intro to what mosquito control and surveillance looks like in New Orleans. So I like to sort of separate this out. What is a survey and what is surveillance? Just to be sure we understand our terminology. A survey can be a one time or in some cases periodic gathering of data that is for a specific purpose. So some examples you might be familiar with are things like a questionnaire or we have folks here that participate in annual wildlife surveys. They'll go to a park and do a bird survey or maybe they do that quarterly or with the different seasons. So that's an example of a survey. Surveillance, on the other hand, is repeated data collection over time, typically over shorter time scales. And what you're trying to get from that is to be able to see and detect changes over time. So this might be something like municipal water quality testing. You have to do it constantly to make sure there are no negative changes. Hospital disease reporting. So surveillance is an ongoing process that doesn't stop. Why are surveillance programs important uh, for us in mosquito control? First and foremost, it can tell us which species are active, what time of the year they're active, and if we can identify them correctly, we know which ones are vectors. We can also take our vector species and test them for all sorts of different viruses, and so that's really important from a public health perspective. It can provide the location and seasonal patterns of species. This helps us to plan both with resources, funding, with staff, and we can also use our data to share with others. Um, we actually just the other day had a vector serve and the CDC requested use of our data sets to create new national maps of species distributions. So having that kind of networking and connection uh, with other folks and their data sets is really important. Most importantly, appropriate and timely response to updated current surveillance data is absolutely the key to preventing and controlling mosquito-borne disease outbreaks. It helps us a lot if we know where everything is and what's going on before we have a problem. So surveillance here at New Orleans Mosquito Control has increased quite a bit in the last 10 or 15 years. We started off in 2006 with only 19 trap locations. We kept adding and optimizing throughout the years. Um, currently, we have 46 trap locations that cover uh, most of Orleans Parish. Um, we also reestablished 80s albopictus and 80s aegypti surveillance using BG traps in 2016. Um, we have reconfigured that program and sort of tweaked it over time to improve it. Um, and now we have, I think we have 24 locations throughout the city for BG traps that we do weekly in the summer months. 
So what do we do for surveillance? Um, so larvae and pupae is not really something that we do surveillance for. This is something that's more of a survey for point inspections. So we do have areas that we hit pretty regularly, things like drainage ditches, pools that we know are problematic and things of that nature. Um, larvae and pupae though are sort of a absence presence uh, question rather than a what species do we have? How are those abundances changing? you don't see a whole lot of linkage between your adult data and your larval and pupil data. So for us, it's really just knowing what's there. Is it something that needs to be treated? For the adults, we have three different trap types that we use. We have our gravid traps on the bottom left. The way these work is you fill that little tub with um, kind of a stinky solution that has water, hay, and fish emulsion fertilizer. Um, Culex mosquitoes is what these traps are targeting. They tend to like to lay their eggs in environments that have very stinky, very organic water. And so they go in to lay their eggs, they float on the uh, surface tension, and then they ultimately get sucked up through an updraft fan in the middle of that collection bag. CDC light traps operate similarly. They are baited with dry ice in the thermos from the top. The dry ice uh, sort of sublimates. There's holes drilled in the side. It creates a carbon dioxide signature that attracts the mosquitoes. They go underneath that little hood to go rest and try to figure out where the carbon dioxide is coming from. And then they get sucked down by a downdraft fan into the net. And then finally, we have the BG Sentinel. We have Sentinel-2s. Um, it has this little cup uh, that attracts our container breeding mosquitoes, and there's a downdraft fan. Uh, we have a product called a BG Lure that is an insert that's supposed to mimic the smell of human skin. We found that they don't work as well on their own and recently added a CO2 bait as well with dry ice, and we found that that improved uh, capture rates by quite a bit, so we're doing that now. So what does this tell us? It tells us which species are out there, whether they're vectors, where they are geographically in the city, which actually varies a lot species to species, and then, sorry, how to best target our control methods, right? Our gravid traps, here are our locations throughout the city. Again, we have 46. They're typically at city agencies like libraries, um, you know, city gas stations, different parks that are owned by the city, firehouses, things of that nature. We have a few spots way out in the in the parish that um, are private property that we have permission to trap on their uh, on their land. So what happens? We deploy these traps every single Monday year round. The traps come back on Tuesdays. My very talented staff sits in the lab and they ID all of the mosquitoes to species. So once they are identified to species, we put the species of medical importance or veterinary importance or whatever we want to test. They go into little tubes and then they get driven up to LSU on Wednesday mornings for arboviral screening. Typically in the summer, we are testing for West Nile, um, St. Louis encephalitis and Eastern equine encephalitis. And in the winter months, we test only for West Nile. However, LATL has capability to test for lots of different pathogens. So if we had something that we wanted tested, we would just need to ask. How are our control decisions made? Really based on vector numbers and arbovirus results, there are lots of different things that go into that control um, decision making process, which we'll talk about later. But these are really, as a public health organization, the core of our decision making is around these arbovirus results and the presence of vectors. And this is the core activity of the surveillance program here. So now that we are the mosquito control district has sent up our samples to the arboviral diagnostic lab. They will get those results. Those results are shared through a now a new interface called VectorServe with city and state departments of health. The state veterinarian has access to this. Federal reporting agencies like the CDC have access to it. And now with our new VectorServe uh, gateway, all Louisiana districts should theoretically have access to our data our uh, West Nile um, screening results and lots of other things that we're able to put into this. And this is a brand new uh, database essentially that we just joined this year, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. And then the federal reporting agencies, namely CDC, has a national data repository called ArboNet. Um, and this is a really cool feature that anyone can go online and look at. So I'll show you what that looks like. 
VectorServe, uh, again, we just started this year. It is a web-based platform for data management that is used by vector control and public health agencies in the US. This is what it looks like. It started in 2006 in California, and it was just called VectorServe, um, and most of their mosquito and vector control districts were using it. It's where you can upload your arboviral stuff. There's a tick data. There's all sorts of maps and tools. You can upload insecticide resistance results. So it's a really cool sort of interface. Starting in 2017, VectorServe expanded to include other states. I think they have 14 member states now and also US affiliated Pacific Islands. So we just migrated to the system uh, back on January 1st. And so our version of it is called Louisiana Serve. So the public, the general public doesn't have access to this. This is only for the internal agencies, um, but it, it does go to uh, all sorts of different reporting. So you could probably um, get the data through other uh, uh, methods if you wanted to. Arbonet is the national database. So the website is www.cdc.gov forward slash Arbonet. And I just wanted to show you an example of the type of information you can get from this site. So this is an example for West Nile virus from 2020. And you can see here I have West Nile virus chosen, uh, which is just what I wanted to look at, but they have all of these different um, data sets available, uh, black fee, triple E, dengue, chikungunya, Zika. And so this map represents, I just zoomed in on sort of the Southeast, um, the human case data for West Nile in 2020. You can also look at the mosquito data. So this is the return of positive mosquito pools. Um, so that's really interesting. And again, uh, they have birds, you can look up sentinel animals, you can look up veterinary reports. So this is a really great resource. Uh, the only caveat is that, as we talked about before, not every single district in the US has surveillance. Um, and if they do, they may not all be submitting their samples for uh, any kind of testing. So again, there are gaps in this information based on whether a district does or does not, or a county or a parish does or does not participate. So we're going to move on to sort of a different type of surveillance. We've talked about adult surveillance, why it's important, how that works. Um, now we want to move to breeding site surveillance. This is something that uh, we have been doing here for quite some time. Uh, the way we were conducting it, it wasn't really organized into a program per se. It was something we were sort of doing all independently as inspectors, as managers. Um, and in 2018, 2019, we sort of pulled it together and said, OK, you know what we need? We don't really know how important some of these uh, breeding sites are or potential breeding sites are for our, their contribution to the adult mosquito populations here. And we don't really know what the extent of the problem is throughout the parish with potential breeding sites. So we started with programmatic surveillance of breeding sites in late 2018, early 2019. Um, and when the when the program began, it was really just inspectors in trucks driving around after rains looking for problem areas. We also discovered a lot of the areas through service requests. So uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the city of New Orleans participates in the 311 system. So folks can call in from the city and request inspections, let us know if there's any issue with mosquitoes or rodents or termites. Um, and so a lot of sort of the insight of where these problem locations were have come from service requests and also the entire staff as they're out in the city doing their daily duties. Um, they will give me a call or give program managers a call and say, hey, you know, I see this big construction site. That's a problem. You might want to add it to your map. And so we have been mapping and categorizing sites throughout the city um, for quite some time. Some of the common concerns, standing water after rains, so basically low-lying areas that will hold water after rain, tires, drainage ditches that become problematic, swales, which is the picture on the top left here. So these are sort of just natural indentations in the ground that hold water after heavy rains. Great example of that would be some of the neutral grounds, areas on Wisner, if you are here in New Orleans, um, Audubon Park. So just areas, that I think actually this is a picture of Audubon Park. So they will hold water just a few inches, but if the ground is low lying enough, it can hold water long enough to breed mosquitoes, and they certainly do. Um, construction sites are another one, abandoned swimming pools or unkept swimming pools, and then large fountains, which is a big thing in New Orleans. So I have this video. Um, this is a video of a swale 
that I like to show um, just because it's kind of amazing. So this is just water that has gathered um, on the ground after heavy rain in a park, you know, kids and dogs and people playing Frisbee, whatever. Um, those are mosquito pupae. So that is that final developmental stage before they become adults. And as he sort of backs out, um, one of our inspectors, I believe Trevor took this video, there's so many mosquito pupae in this water and it's not very, uh, very deep. You're talking about maybe a few inches, but the size is very extensive in terms of square footage. So things like this are definitely a problem that we had to start, uh, start dealing with. So here is, uh, it's kind of an older map, but I just put it here as an example to show you um, exactly what we're talking about with some of the breeding sites in New Orleans. So on this map, uh, it's all of Orleans Parish and in the blue dots, those represent tires. Now I'm not talking about individual tires, I'm talking about piles of tires. Um, and some of them, especially in this upper portion, which is an area called New Orleans East, um, some of the piles can be, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. So um, each dot is a pile. Red are the swales. So these are those areas that we talked about that I just showed you the video of, sort of indentations on the ground that routinely fill with water and breed mosquitoes. And then the green dots, which you see a lot more of them sort of up here in the city park area, Lakeview area, those are construction projects that vary in nature, um, infrastructure related issues like potholes, broken water mains, um, sort of like concrete issues where they're holding water. So it can really be a broad, uh, a really broad sort of mix of things that we generally categorize as an infrastructure related issue. So those are the green. So as you can see, this is really a program in and of itself. It takes an enormous amount of effort to visit these sites routinely, but these are areas that we know produce a lot of mosquitoes. And so we do the very best we can to keep up with the status of each of these sites, make sure they're being inspected frequently, make sure they're being treated frequently. And we actually have some new software that's helping us uh, with that. So that program has come a really long way. So now we're gonna talk about source reduction. Um, source reduction uh, sounds obvious, reducing the source of mosquitoes, right? So it can basically encompass removing standing water and conducive conditions for mosquitoes. What are conducive conditions? Um, if you look at this picture on the top, I would say that that is a conducive condition for mosquito breeding. So having a ton of stuff on your porch, um containers any kind of plant pots that have the trays in the bottom wheelbarrows tarps that are just laying in the backyard even indentations in the yard that should probably be filled those are all conducive conditions to have a lot of mosquitoes breeding on your property um, after a heavy rain so what do we do um, we need to turn over containers we uh, tell folks to remove any clutter because you never know what can breed mosquitoes they can breed in a very small amount of water a big one is storm drains, gutters on the top. If you have very clogged gutters and the rain can accumulate there, you will have tons of mosquitoes breeding in your gutters. Flush them out if needed. Dispose of any bulky waste, tires, plant trays, buckets, ice chests, even children's toys. Um, We've had several uh, inspection results where we came back and they had, you know, the kids water tables in the backyard or a kid's tricycle that had a little, uh, you know, container in the back of it, a little basket uh, that could fill with water. So things that you don't necessarily think about, just outdoor toys um, that can become a problem in the summer. I always tell everybody that really 10 minutes a week is all it takes to effectively perform source reduction around your home and yard. Uh, mosquitoes need a minimum of six to seven days to go from egg to adult and that's our fastest developing species that we know of so if you're just going once a week and spending 10 or 15 minutes just walking around the house and yard that is perfectly sufficient to make sure you're not producing mosquitoes on your property so I mentioned service requests um, and they sort of go hand in hand with the inspections. Uh, we do get service requests from residents through 311. We also get emails to our office. We also get phone calls. Um, there are various reasons that they call us. Um, so typically what we will do is we'll take the report. We try to get out to the property as soon as possible. We inspect it. We look for things that can be remedied. We chat with the resident typically, either in person or by phone, about source reduction and how to make sure they don't have conducive conditions. 
in some cases when we go to do inspections we find it has nothing to do with something the resident is doing sometimes it's a street issue um, again like one of those infrastructure related issues a construction site something like that um, if that is the case we make sure to contact the appropriate agency let them know what the problem is and then follow up to make sure that whatever it is gets remedied we can also apply larvicides or do other control methods while we're there to make sure we're taking care of the problem so if you look on the bottom left here, I have a little graph of all of the service requests that we completed last year. Uh, the blue is how many we had during that month, and then the red line is our average response time in days. And then on the bottom right, which is kind of interesting, um, how many times uh, there was an issue, a specific issue during an inspection, and then how many times it was uh, required that we treat it in order to get rid of larvae or pupae. So most common things in New Orleans, pools or fountains, tires is a big one, standing water of a general nature, containers that are holding water and breeding mosquitoes, blighted property. Um, we get calls about that quite a lot, although not it's not frequent that we have to do anything at those sites. Um, and then sometimes we go out and we just can't find anything, but that's pretty rare. When we perform inspections, uh, we will inspect folks' yards if they want us to, or city-owned areas of the streets looking around for standing water. We will remove turnover cover or empty and rinse out any containers. If you look at the pictures on the left, these are some of the sort of common things that we'll see when we go to do an inspection. Uh, we will treat with larvicides when appropriate, and then again, we chat with the residents and kind of just um, kind of help them understand what some of the problems are, um, and then and then talk to other agencies if we need to. So biological control, this is one of the methods of control that we do here in New Orleans. What is biological control? It's simply just utilizing natural enemies to control populations of unwanted organisms. So there are lots of examples of success in biological control. This is another area of research and pest control that really originated a very long time ago with agricultural pests. Um, it can be successful. There are lots of examples of success, but it requires a ton of research and you really have to understand your species biology and how your target pest interacts with the species. I like to throw this graph up um, again a lot of words you don't have to read them all but I just want to point out that this is nothing new this is something that's been around for a long time um, and this is sort of a graph that shows you the different types of biological control organisms that are commonly used to control both invasive plants and invasive insects so if you have a non-native invasive plant on the left there are lots of different organisms here you can use phytophages arthropods um, so those are pretty effective. You can use herbivorous vertebrates, and then you can also use different types of pathogens. Um, same thing, more or less, uh, if you're trying to control invasive insects or mosquitoes in our case, you can use predatory insects. Um, you can use generalist predators or other predaceous insects. You can use parasites or parasitoids um, that will parasitize and kill. Um, and then you also have pathogens as well. So for us, one of the things we use is this little uh, guy that will really effectively control mosquito larvae. Um, so this is your fish, Gambusia affinis, also called the mosquito fish. You can see from the picture on the right, they're really tiny little guys. They do get a little bit larger than that um, when they're fully grown adults, but um, they're pretty small. They're little guppies. The plus of using these is that they have a very broad diet. Um, so they love to eat mosquito larvae. They are voracious feeders on mosquito larvae, but they don't need them to survive. So you can put these in an abandoned swimming pool, for example, or a large fountain or um, maybe a backyard pond. Um, and as long as they have something to eat, uh, they'll, they'll be just fine. They're very small and easy to manipulate, so you can just move them around in a bag. Um, they survive in a variety of habitats. They're very tolerant to yucky water. They occur naturally in drainage ditches here. Uh, they tolerate a wide temperature range, so they do just fine outdoors in the winter. They reproduce very quickly, so folks will come and ask us, there's an abandoned swimming pool at the property next door. Nobody has lived there in years, you know, and we can give them maybe 10 or 15 fish, and if they put them in the pool, they will reproduce quickly enough to where they have a really solid population, um, large enough to control uh, mosquitoes in that pool pretty quickly. 
We also use them in drainage ditches, pools, large fountains, and ponds. Well, we talked about that already. But these are really cool little critters. Copepods are another biological control organism that we have extensive experience raising and working with. These are micro crustaceans, so they're very tiny crustaceans, about a millimeter in length as full grown adults. They are naturally abundant. They're almost ubiquitous in aquatic environments around here. So in swamp and woodland pools and roadside dishes, if you go and do a little scoop, you'll get a ton of copepods. They are voracious predators of first instar larvae. So because of their very small size, uh, they tend to not go after mosquito larvae that are larger than that very first stage. Um, and if you remember, I told you they're so small at that stage that you almost can't see them with the naked eye. They thrive in habitats that are too small for fish, and this is key. Uh, one of the programs that we have been trying to start and that we've invested a lot of research into in the last few years is their use for mosquito control in waste tires. Anyone from New Orleans that has driven around to certain parts of the Ninth Ward or the East or even parts of the West Bank knows that we have a, a pretty big problem with tire dumping here in New Orleans. And despite our best efforts and collaborations with sanitation and other state entities, we are not able to remove all of them in a timely manner. The other problem is that the larvicides we use for treatment of mosquitoes and tires are very expensive and don't have a very long residual effect. So in other words, you have to reapply over and over and over again in short time scales. So our idea was maybe we can put these copepods in the waste tires and maybe they will thrive in there and continue to control mosquitoes in the tires for a longer period of time. Um, they can also be used in smaller habitats like fountains. And again, like I said, they're already ubiquitous in outdoor environments that have water that is that's permanent water. So we love this idea. We want to use them. We're working on it. We haven't been able to operationalize it yet, but we have a lot of data showing that in theory it works. It's great because they're convenient. They're inexpensive to raise. They're easy to transport. They can persist in the environment under certain conditions and one caveat that at the certain conditions they are not desiccation resistant they have to have water so if you put them in a tire and that tire completely dries out they won't survive it so under certain conditions though they're very uh temperature hardy they can do pretty well over winter and they can survive in a very small amount of water they also have a high tolerance for um sort of yucky water so kind of the perfect little guy this is mesocyclops longicetus this is one of the species that we raise here Larvicides and adulticides is another method of control. Uh, so for adulticides, I do always like to talk about why we spray. What is an adulticide and what is its utility compared to other control methods? Adulticides are designed for fast knockout of adult vector populations. So if you have your results come back and you see that there are West Nile positive mosquitoes in area A, you're going to want to go to area A and use your adulticide because that is what's going to kill your flying adult vectors in that area. They're ultra low volume concentrations. That is what we use. They're formulated for the insect body size. So we have a mounting amount of data showing that adulticides are relatively ineffective at killing other things that are not small insects, even larger insects, in many cases are not affected because of the concentrations that we use. These adulticides are not designed to persist in the environment, so this is really just a fast knockdown and then it degrades very, very rapidly. So the effect of your adulticide even the next day is probably a little to nothing. What we do here is we strive to use the least environmentally impactful methods that is part of the IPM framework. You want to do the least damage possible and be very smart about what you're doing. So we do minimize our use of chemicals. We only spray when we feel like we need to spray because it's a public health issue. And we follow a pretty strict decision making process about when to adulticide. Another thing that we try to do is since we know the adulticides are only going to knock down those adult populations and that the effect is very short lived. We want to rotate with the use of larvicides to also bring down the populations of vectors that are going to be emerging and then potentially interacting with those infected hosts again. 
So what types of larvicides do we use? Uh, one of the most common ones, and this is particularly useful in areas like the video I showed you where we have a lot of pupae, we use surface oils. So they're made of all sorts of different materials. One that we use really frequently is called cocoa bear, um, and this is a mineral oil, coconut oil blend. And what it does is it puts a really tiny film at the surface of the water, and that blocks the mosquito's respiratory siphon from accessing the air and sort of suffocates them. Um, it is effective on pupae. There are very few products that are effective on pupae, and this is one of them. Another one that we use is BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis. This is a larvicide that was developed in a lab, but it is derived from soil bacteria. So BTI is something that is ubiquitous in the natural environment, but what they do is they isolate it in the lab, and then when mosquito larvae ingest it, it produces a toxin that only targets the midgut and nematocerin flies. So black flies, mosquitoes, flies, midges, the larvae of these organisms have a specific target site that this toxin binds to, and it causes the midgut to lice, so it kind of perforates it, and then they slowly die. They never make it to adulthood. The reason we really like this product is because it is so species specific in its effect. It does not affect other insects, it does not affect fish, it does not affect pets, dogs, cats, or even people. I have seen people mix this into a glass of water and drink it as a proof of concept. Now, I don't know that I would do that, but you could <laughs> if you wanted to. Um, so we really like this product. Bacillus sphericus is another um, just species of larvicide that's also from soil bacteria. The only difference between these two is that the BTI tends to work better on one group of species, whereas sphericus tends to work better on another group, especially the Culex. Culex are not particularly responsive to BTI, but they are to sphericus. Um, the truck photo in the middle is um, actually our area-wide larvicide rig. So when you see the mosquito trucks coming down the street and you hear them, you may assume they're always those adulticides, not always. Many districts now have area-wide larvicide capacity. So what we do is we take this BTI and we mix it with water and it becomes a, a solution. And then we spray it out of the back of the truck. It is not always red like that. That was a, a trial we were doing in an open field that we had to dye it, but it's just a clear liquid. Um, and that's really useful because when it's pushed out of the truck, it can reach a lot of the uh, containers in the area. So when we talk about mosquito control and our decision making process, uh, we talked about action thresholds in IPM, and that's exactly what this is. What governs your control decisions? And for us and for any district or program that's following an IPM framework, that is going to be data. The number one most important piece of data we go by week to week is whether we have virus positive pools of mosquitoes. So that is our number one. We have to knock down the adult populations that we know are currently right now capable of vectoring diseases to people and animals. In the absence of positive pools of mosquitoes, our next criteria would be high vector abundance. So we may get our West Nile results back and everything's good. We don't have any mosquitoes that tested positive, but we know in this one area of the city, we have a ton of Culex concofasciatus. They're higher there than anywhere else in the city. That might trigger us, depending on the numbers, to go take control actions in that area. That's a preventative measure. Next, we have residential service requests. So if we're getting a lot of 311 service requests, a lot of calls, a lot of emails about something in a certain area, we'll go check it out first, perform an inspection. If we find that numbers are higher there for any reason, we might go ahead and, and do some control. And then finally, staff observations. And I put this in there because we all have been here long enough, my folks here, my staff here, that you kind of have an intuition. We know what high numbers are for us. We may not have the exact same threshold as a neighboring district, but we have very different problems probably than our neighboring district. And so you have to kind of understand intuitively, hey, there's something going on here. There's an 80s Vexans in the middle of the city in this one area, and I haven't seen it anywhere else. Something's going on, right? So that might trigger control decisions for us as well. But regardless of what we do, what order we do it in, and exactly where we do it, it all has to be data driven. Other variables to consider. So once we decide that we're going to make a control action, we have to think about a lot of other things. 
First, we have to consider what the life stages of the mosquitoes in our problem areas. Do we need to use larvicides? Do we need to use adulticides? Or do we need to use both? If we know there are positive pools of mosquitoes, that there's some virus circulation, we probably want to do both because we want to break that transmission cycle by killing the adults and preventing the larvae in the area from, from maturing to adulthood. We also have to consider the geography or topography of the target treatment area. Is it easy to access? Is it a forest area? Are there a lot of trees? Do we need to take a truck? Would it be better to go on foot and go in there to hand distribute larvicides? Do we need to go with aerial application? So the size and sort of geography of the area is an important consideration. And then finally, things like temperature, how windy it is, whether it's raining and how heavy it's raining, all of these things affect the equipment we use, how staffed we have to be to make it happen, which product we're gonna use, what our application method is, rates of application. So there's a lot that sort of goes into what are we going to do and when. I think people people don't appreciate that it's a really kind of complicated, complex problem to solve every week. Resistance testing, um, this is another big part of our IPM framework. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the importance of this, how it's done and how we do it here. So what is insecticide resistance? You may or may not have heard, this is becoming an increasingly scary problem, uh, not just here, but globally. Uh, insecticide resistance is basically whether or not an insect survives exposure to what should be a lethal dose of an insecticide. We do not have that many classes of pesticides that kill mosquitoes. So it is very important that the classes of pesticides we do use are capable of killing them in the case that we have a disease outbreak. So what essentially happens when you see insecticide resistance building is that you have your wild type mosquitoes, your guys that are just out in the field, Naturally, some of them will just have the genetics that make them a little bit more resistance to a pesticide than others. So when you use that pesticide, you are killing all of the population except the ones that can survive. So when the next generation comes, the ones that survive are the ones that are reproducing. They pass on those genetic traits and then so on and so on until you have a fully resistant population. Um, over successive generations. So essentially, by using pesticides to control mosquitoes, you are also simultaneously selecting your mosquito population for resistance to those pesticides. And it's just one of those things that, you know, it's kind of unavoidable, but you have to monitor it because there are ways that you can mitigate that from happening. So the time to act to mitigate effects of insecticide resistance is way, way, way before you have a fully resistant population because at that point, there's very little you can do. So what does an insecticide resistance monitoring program look like? The first method is bottle bioassays, which were developed by the CDC. And this is sort of a standard, quick, sort of easy method to get data on insecticide resistance. Um, there are also methods of genetic testing that have been developed over the last decade. And in 2018, our uh, department gained capacity and infrastructure for genetic testing. And so there are actually a few different things uh, that we are doing here in-house now. We are doing the bottle bioassays. We do the KDR testing for genetics. We also have a, a staff member here who's doing topical applications and then also enzyme assays. And so if you look down here, we have sort of four different methods that we're using right now. Bottle bioassays and topical applications. These are the two assays that tell us if our population has resistance or not. The KDR, which is the genetic testing, and then the enzyme assays, that is not testing whether or not our insecticides work. That is saying, if you do have resistance, what is the mechanism of that resistance? Why is it occurring? And so I wanna talk just briefly about each of these so that we can go through some of the terminology and sort of show you what it looks like. So first for bottle bioassays, you roll the bottles with insecticide. So the inside of the bottle is coated with insecticide. Then you add mosquitoes to the bottles. And then you simply record the percent mortality of those mosquitoes over time. So for this bottle bioassay procedure, your level of replication is the level of the bottle. 
So you have to have multiple bottles with numerous mosquitoes, usually 25 to 30 each inside. And then you take that average percent mortality over time and compare it to your controls and to what the CDC has told us is the amount of time they should be dying in. The topical assays, which Erin is doing here, uh, so it's kind of the same concept, except uh, for the topical application, you're using a very small syringe it's called a Hamilton syringe. You are putting a droplet, uh, a solution that is an exact dose directly onto the thorax of the adult mosquito. Some people claim, and there are different schools of thought on this, that this method might be a little more accurate because it is a very exact dosage. You're not waiting to see if the mosquito makes contact with the side of the bottle or if each mosquito contacts it differently or touches it with a different body part. So it's a little more, um, a little more exact of an assay. For this, one of the major benefits that we have found is that replication is at the level of the individual mosquito. So rather than having to raise thousands of mosquitoes so you can have multiple bottles with 20 or 30 and having to replicate that a bunch of times, you can just do 25 or 30 mosquitoes and use those results. So we like both, we do both, but this one seems to be a little more efficient. For the genetic testing, this is uh, something called KDR testing. KDR stands for knockdown resistance. And so what this assay does is tests for potential resistance, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that it is resistant. It means that it is a, there's the presence of a genetic mutation that we know is associated with decreased effectiveness for pyrethroids, which is one class of chemical we use. There are lots of different mutations that can occur. Um, so it can be uh, target site insensitivity, mutation in voltage gated sodium channel. That's not really important. The point is if you detect the genetic alleles that are known to confer resistance, there is a possibility that that population is either building or already resistant. So this is something done on a real time PCR machine, um, full, uh, fully open. I am not one of the persons who conducts these tests. I do help rear their mosquitoes, but I can get you in touch with the two folks that are running this program if you're interested. The last thing that we are doing here is called enzyme testing. Um, so this is an assay where you collect mosquitoes and you do a plate calorimetric assay that measures detoxification enzymes. So the theory is that some mosquitoes have a higher level of these enzymes that can break down insecticides. So essentially higher enzyme levels might result in higher resistance. So again, this is testing for the mechanism of resistance, not necessarily whether they are resistant. So what you get at the end of these uh, activities is when you're doing multiple different resistance screening assays, you can sort of compare the results from all of your different assays and you can try to gain a better understanding of the reasons that your populations are showing this resistance. So if you just focus on the graph on the top left, you can see that we have the blue bars are results from the topical assays, the orange bars are results from your bottle bioassays, and then on the top left, the gray line is measuring one specific detoxification enzyme called alpha esterase. And you do see, especially if you look at just the orange line, a peak in this detoxification enzyme for the two where you have very little mortality in the bottles. So we might look at a graph like this and say, okay, in this case, at least for populations at those sites, it seems that this elevated enzyme activity might be associated with, uh, with our reduced mortality or resistance. So just an example, again, happy to put you in touch with the folks who do this here. Um, I am just a helper, not the expert, but I love the program. It's very fascinating. And if you wanna learn more, please let us know. So the final uh, IPM or IMM tenant I want to talk about today is public education and public education really sort of feeds into the prevention aspect of IPM. There are lots of different ways that we engage with the public here. Uh, one of the primary ways is chatting with residents. Folks will call us, email us, they want to talk. When we've got to do inspections, they'll want to talk and sort of get that information from us. So that's a really nice vehicle for us to be able to engage and, and educate. We have a ton of educational materials. We create flyers. We have a website. 
Um, thanks to uh, Miss Asasia Carter, who introduced me today. Um, she has really taken our social media to the next level. We have amazing infographics, our tip and toss campaign, educational offerings, all sorts of stuff. Um, our, our websites and social media outlets have really become fun to follow, all sorts of factoids, and also really useful information about what's going on here. It keeps us transparent. Um, demonstrations at outreach events. We go to schools, we table at community events. We're involved in all sorts of stuff throughout the city. Um, you will see us with our little mosquito control banner. We usually bring some organisms so people can look at them. Um, it's pretty fun. We do things like we're doing today, webinars. We have internal people speak. We also have invited speakers from other organizations, other universities, health department, etc. When there's vital information that we need to get out, we go through press releases. Sometimes we do media interviews. Uh, we also participate in other programming uh, with health departments, etc. So we kind of just get out there however we can. I mean, I think that's a really important point. It maintains our transparency. It helps us with public trust. Um, and it also just gets the information out there that you might not have access to otherwise. We also do a lot of educational and professional training here for pest control industry folks. Tomorrow and the next day, as an example, we have a recertification event that will take most of the day um, for general pest control, pesticide applicator recertifications. We have coming next month on April 25th, 26th, and 27th, our 10th annual Mosquito Academy. Uh, this is a workshop that is designed for general standard and 8A certification for pest control licensees, but it's also just a great general information course, maybe for new graduate students or undergrad students who want to learn about mosquito control. It's a, a all encompassing hands on deck of everything we've talked about here today. Recently, we added a advanced mosquito ID workshop to the third day of that event, so that's been really fun. We teach people how to ID 27 different species across 11 or 12 genera. Um, that's been really successful, and we get a lot of folks interested in that. Um, and so we just engage with our peers, the pest control and public health community, to try to make sure we're all on the same page about best practices, essentially. Some of the larger outreach events we do, we have Bug Fest. Uh, this is something that we do here um, on our giant front lawn area this year. It's going to be hosted on October 14th. Uh, weather should be really nice. This is a great thing where we have, you know, different booths, different event sponsors. Audubon Nature Institute usually comes. There's games, there's races, there's all sorts of activities, food trucks. Uh, so this is an opportunity to engage with the residents. It's a really, really fun day. You can learn about general entomology, all sorts of pests and insects. Um, and so we love doing these large events. Here's Erin uh, and I uh, doing actually my daughter's preschool. School demonstrations are really awesome because you can bring your turtles and your fish and your non-biting mosquitoes and you get to show the kids all of these little biocontrol organisms. The kids get really, really excited about it. We have coloring books and little stuffed animals and things they can play with. But what's great about it is that it gets the kids really excited and then they can take the literature home to their parents. And then they want to talk about it for weeks and weeks, how they saw the turtles and the fish, but then the parents get the really relevant information. So um, strategic, but also a whole lot of fun. And lastly, we really couldn't do what we do. We couldn't maintain our best practices and continue to be as successful as we are without the amazing agency and institutional partnerships we have universities, different job organizations, agricultural organizations, private pest control companies, health departments, federal health, you name it. This is not exhaustive. We have so many direct lines to different people that help us stay on top of that operational research and best practices. And so we really couldn't do what we do without them. So in summary, uh, mosquito control is not just spraying a truck and killing mosquitoes. It really encompasses all activities that are aimed at, at smart management of populations and smart assessment of public health and economic risk. A robust surveillance program does a lot of different things, which we touched on sort of each of those things today. You need to have really good infrastructure. So your equipment, your surveillance capacity, your response capacity, really highly trained personnel. These are all really important for um, having an efficient program. 
interagency and partner cooperation is absolutely key. And then for that really nice prevention, you have to have that education and outreach component and sort of direct lines to your uh, peer network. So those are all really important things. So I hope today that gave you a decent uh, overview of what we do here and, and what a program looks like. And at that point, I will take any questions. OK, we do have a question in the chat. The first question is, does BTI persist as in after treatment? Do they breed and grow in the environment? That's a good question. So BTI is supposed to have residual activity. I think the label says seven to 14 days is how long it's supposed to last. Um, full disclosure in the type of environment that we have here, especially um, it's broken down easily by high temperature. It's broken down easily by UV. Um, for example, in a tire or something, chemical leachate can really break it down. So for us, I think at least anecdotally, we're probably looking at three to five days of activity in these environments before we'll see mosquitoes and all sorts of organisms happily breeding in it. And, th and that is one of the limitations of BTI. It, it's it's a wonderful product. It's efficient. It's very target specific, but it does require pretty frequent reapplication. Thank you. Um, that's the only question I actually see in the chat right now. Oh, here's another um, one. You see it thoughts on BTI yeah, versus you, yeah. IGR use? Thoughts on BTI. So, um, my opinion on that, I've always been anti-IGR because I personally, um, and this is not, you know, necessarily the position of my whole department, this is me personally being the ecologist, uh, I haven't been a huge fan of IGRs because it makes me nervous about the non-target effects. Um, but I will tell you what has sort of changed my mind about it and what has led me to do a lot more research is uh, looking into things like waste tires where we have this enormous problem um, that we just don't have a good solution for. BTI, to treat all of the tires in the city with BTI, would uh, you're talking about millions of dollars of product, uh, and we just can't do it. And staff, you know. So I'm looking into some products now that are a blend of the two. It's a methoprene BTI mix, um, and I've looked at some other IGRs like pyroproxifen, and I'm considering whether because the cost is so much lower, if we could use it in something like container systems and not be as worried about those non-target effects. Um, if there are other fauna in waste tires, I'm much less concerned about that than, you know, for example, a wetland or a, a really nice woodland pool or something like that. So um, IGRs have their benefits. They last a heck of a lot longer than the bioirrational larvicides and their uh, the dosage needed is much smaller, so it's a lot more economical. Um, so I would say my thoughts are evolving BTI if you can, but I think IGRs have their place uh, in mosquito control if you're able to use them wisely. <laughs> Hemagogus for life, James says. <laughs> they are cool mosquitoes. I think that wraps up the questions. If you have any other questions that you think of, once again, you can email them to us at education at nola.gov and we can get Dr. Bro to answer them. I want to thank everyone for coming out today to join us in today's webinar. Part two will be Tuesday, March 28th, and we'll be discussing mosquitoes and disease. So once again, have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Bro. Thank you. Thank everyone for being here.